The uh, first guest of the program today from the Berkeley County Board of Education, the president of the BOE, Pat Murphy. Pat, good morning to you, sir. How are you feeling today? Well, before I begin, may I make a public announcement? You may. Yeah, pull, the, pull the mic closer to you so you don't have to lean. I don't want you getting a bad back from your appearance today. Okay. This is to my wife, Bev. Uh, check the wood stove. Make sure I shut the flue. <laughs> yes. Check the wood stove. <laughs> Hey, you know what? I don't want to hear fire engines so uh, we're headed to your house, dude. That's, uh, I appreciate that. Also, the Vice President, Jackie Long. Good morning, Jacqueline. Good morning. How's things going at the Jackie Long st- station today? Yeah, we're well. We come on, a, come we, closer to your mic. I can't hear you. Bring, we, pull that closer. We had a late board meeting last night, and I pulled in my garage at uh, 1045. 1045. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you getting up early and making the trip in here today. You guys had a lot to discuss yesterday, going until well, 1045. We uh, started with the local uh, LSIC meetings. Yes. There were five to seven, and then the regular board agenda. Let, let's talk about those meetings, the LSIC yeah. meetings, okay? What were the main things you were discussing? Can, can I ask a quick question first? Yes. What does LSIC mean first? Local School Improvement Council. Okay, good. Thank you. Okay. Just wanted to make sure we all know. Yes, I'm sorry. No, no problem. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Get that cl- clarified yes. early on here. So let's talk about some of those meetings. Anything that you need to relay to the public after the conclusion of those five to seven meetings, I think you said you had? Well, uh, well we had four last night. Four, four last schools, night. Had the Hedgesville area. Okay. And uh, I was very impressed. I don't know about Pat, but um, what those schools are doing um, in general every day, what they've always done, and what they're doing now to improve test scores and mm-hmm. um, remediation it's wonderful uh, they've put their whole heart into it give me it, an idea so. of some of the things that they're doing well i know you covered a lot last night so um, it might not i'll be on start the top with hedgesville elementary um number one that hedgesville elementary is now the largest um they have 603 students is that the largest middle school in berkeley county you said is that the it's elementary ele- you said? Ele- elementary okay, school elementary. And, and um they have a Two pre-K, nine kindergarten, eight first grade, and ten second grade. So there's a lot of students there, and and their focus was to regroup and um, to try to bridge the achievement gap. So, mm-hmm. um, and I think they've done great with what they're starting to do. Um, they they want to uh, budget their planning time and implement some yearly projects. Uh, and Pat, you can chime in here. I, uh, the thing I know is first, I want to commend uh, Assistant Superintendent uh, Tanner Burkhart for putting together this uh, this thick list of information. Mm-hmm. The things can about we, can we show this? Just I want to just just for informational purposes. About four inches thick. Is this it? thing is uh, gigantic. This yeah, is mine's on the floor because I don't have room for it. So. Yeah, they. Uh, the mobility rate of the teachers, the attendance rate of the students, um, are factors which contribute to the uh, positive showing of the schools in this district. Um, I mean, we across the county, uh, we need to improve our academics. Yes, across the state for that. Yes, across, across the, the state. country. Right. Well. Um, we're comparing ourselves to other West Virginia counties, and a couple of schools in this district are outperforming not only the county schools but the uh, state schools. And the uh, and I and I was looking for trends of why that's happening, but we are competing to be better than the worst mm-hmm. in the state, as, as you just alluded to. Excuse me, and uh, but but they are doing things out there and, it, and you look at the uh, different contributing factors of the staff uh, tenure and, and uh, students attendance you see indicators of, of that as well as other things here so, so they tend to have more tenured teachers and better attendance in those schools and that yeah. leads to better grades obviously. And, and I think um, and, and and I'm not making uh, excuses for the um, inner city schools but the outer school, outer, outer county schools have better attendance mm-hmm. and, um, you know, better parent participation. And 
and that's not ex an excuse, but it's just a fact. Mm -hmm. Now, Hedgesville, they, they're going to implement guided math support, and, and they have an academic coach, and they're going to uh, ongoing math professional development for their staff. But what I thought was one of the most um, – what what struck with to me is the partnership they have with Blue Ridge Community College and um, the partnership with the Boys and Girls Club. They have uh, someone from Blue Ridge that comes in, I think, once a week, Pat? I, I, I don't remember. I was kind of overwhelmed by all the data. Um, mm -hmm. And comes on site and, and does uh, remediation and works with these students in math. So... Um, it's, it's like a federal work study program, mm -hmm. but it it's works well. So, and the kids and are. Is that grant funded, basically? I don't think so. So they just come in as a partnership. Yeah, with the, they with just the local partnership school. with the local school. That's impressive. Yeah, I thought it was very impressive. I yeah. wish we could do that. I, I, I'd like to contact them to see if they would do that with more of our schools. So, mm -hmm. I, I applaud uh, Melissa Holland, the principal, for implementing that with Blue Ridge. So. And that was at which elementary school? Uh, Hedgesville Elementary. Hedgesville Elementary, okay. Can I ask a quick question? Are there any programs where, because I know we have a, a shortage of teachers here, we have a shortage of teachers everywhere, which is, is tough. Are there any programs designed to get students, more students who are, say, um, in education, like at Shepherd, or people who are thinking about going to education from Blue Ridge, to get these people in the classrooms more? You know, giving giving support to teachers. Is there a program like that? Do we have anything hooked in with Shepherd yes. like that to bring them in? I mean, I'm not talking like at the end to do their their mandatory no, student, teaching student teaching hours. I'm talking about overall. We have a Jump Start program for high school students, and um, it's working well. Nice. Uh, they uh, one of the programs I experienced when I was going to college is. They had a program by President Johnson. I'm dating myself here. A little bit. A little bit. <laughs> Johnson? Johnson. I would have thought you more of a Wilson administration. Johnson. We'll go with Johnson. <laughs> well, the Johnson I'm talking about uh, succeeded Andrew? Lincoln. <laughs> 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 he's not going to stop, by the way. <laughs> I know. That's great. That's all right. I'm glad he's picking on you and not me. Yeah, right. It's right. the long right. hour, Jackie. You're yeah. still talking. Yeah. yeah, we're still digging the sleep out of our ass. But... Um, uh, Lyndon Johnson had a program for veterans after the after they got out, and it was teacher aides. And you went in day one of college, and uh, you worked two days a week as a teacher's aide and three days a week going to college. And uh, it was very uh, it, it it was a program that was ahead of its time. Now I think the colleges are doing that more. They're putting the people in and their field experience and their and. Uh, uh, at, at lower grades. It's just not your senior year student teaching. Uh, and now, as Jackie said, uh, we're, I'm not familiar with the details. I've read about it, but I don't recall it. Uh, we're, we're, we're trying to recruit t teachers out of high school. I mean, before they graduate from mm -hmm. high school. Hey, I got a question for you from Jeff Haddix from our audience. And uh, he asks how much autonomy a principal has in program development like they're doing at Hedgesville elementary school and we see the results with the better scores i uh, i know mr tyson at tomahawk element uh, intermediate does a lot of uh, math and it reflects in his uh, results i think he's one of the top performing schools in the county for, uh, at that level so uh, you see the individual uh, approaches to it uh, but I don't know how much autonomy principals have because uh, you're, I, I imagine there's a lot of centralization out of the board office trying to get programs going. But I'm sure, I'm sure the motivation at the school level is determined by the principal's leadership there. Well, Jackie? Well, what I was uh, going to say to that is um, – they they have some autonomy, but they it, as Pat said, it has to be centralized because st we have a lot of students that move from one school to the other. Mm -hmm. You know, when, when they're doing uh, something different in one elementary school, or middle school, or high school, high school is much different. But and then they transfer um, two weeks into the school year or in the middle of the school year, and they go to another elementary school and they're doing something totally different in a in a 
uh, math program or a reading program, it's hard on the student, and, and they, you know, they have to start over. So you have to have some kind of centralization uh, with programs. But I assume that there is some leeway for creativity in teaching the subject matter. The curriculum oh, may definitely. match up, but yeah. the creativity yeah. is up to the individual, Yeah, right? definitely, definitely. The, the principal would encourage it more than demonstrate it uh, yeah. out of their staff. Mm -hmm. uh, you would, uh, can, I, can what they're doing at Hedgesville be replicated at, at other schools? And vice, yes, and vice versa. Yeah, it, you're in service training. Uh, what what what's working? Um, you have some of that. We we have a limited number of hours we can have for professional development. That's mm -hmm. that's an area we're talking about. But um, I, I I imagine I'm not. I'm not familiar down the weeds to what's going on in professional development, but I, I remember getting together as levels and talking about what worked. Well, and then when I think, uh, you know, the State Department of Ed's put has put out some guidelines that counties have to follow. So, of course, in our county, f starting to follow those guidelines, and we're passing them down to our schools. So, you can't go off. Um, program too much because we're we're trying to follow those guidelines that they mm -hmm. want us to implement so there's the, a lot going on and, you know we're, we're the there are there are title is i'm sorry pat you have to jump in as soon as you can their title is back to basics was he making yeah he was fun of you or something yeah that i talk too much um remember you're on camera pat yeah Watch what you're doing. All, all evidence will be used against you. <laughs> you know, the Department of Ed's motto now is, you know, back to basics. So they've put that down to the county levels, and that's what we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. So you can't go off program too much, or we're going to have to do what they want us to implement. Now, now some of what you said, the, the circumstances leading up to the better scores had to do with teacher tenure, and you can't replicate that. Teacher tenure is what it is at a particular school. Uh, and attendance. And I don't know how much... The Board of Education has control over whether a student goes to school. That's pretty much up to the parent. And as the kid gets older, well, you know, the, the, well, the student have too. they Have they thought about sending, you know, buses out to pick up the kids? That that might improve attendance. Well, we you know, do. make it easy we, for them to get there. Well, we we go to the door <laughs> other than getting them out of the pajamas. Yeah. The <laughs> There's only so much you can do, right? But yeah. no, no, we, we have a tenants uh, department. Uh, Hal Van Meter leads right. it. And, Talk to Hal. And... Uh, we, you know, we go into court with some of our cases. The problem is, is the backlog in our local courts. Mm -hmm. uh, we're a low priority. Sure. So what are you looking to do there? Are you, are you trying to get some way of enforcing the parent to send the kid to school or what? Um, that's a good question. We, we, we're, we're, we used to do that a lot, but and we still do that. Well, the schools have, a, uh, the counselors have attendance uh, incentives for the students. Uh, yeah. And you try to get them at the earliest ages to um, to uh, it, incentives like little stickers and things like that to get the kids to come. But but one of the questions we as a board ask, and and this this information is compiled by a lot of that, is we ask, take your five bottom students or highest absentee students, and tell us what happened. Now. The numbers don't reflect. I may have to borrow your glasses again to get there, but uh, the, the, all, they are all yours for the whole hour. Okay, but I, I'm going to look for it here while we're while we're stalling, I guess I might say. But but we found that a lot of kids. Here we go. Um, I'm not going to name the school, but uh, here's a student who was. Um, absent about 39 days uh, was uh, and was promoted that's the thing what I'm grade asking. are we talking about there uh, well we didn't identify the grades we kept the students anonymous but this was an elementary school okay well that's well and, and to defend that um, I, th I think everyone was promoted during COVID so a lot of those statistics but this are... is last year okay <laughs> Here's a student who attended 115 days of 180, was att attended 64%. I'm guessing they didn't get a sticker. They not only didn't get a sticker, they got promoted. Why? Why would they get promoted? Well, well, that's they, the well, question we Did we're they asking. make the grade, though? Yeah, we asked that question, and, and um, 
there was some good reasoning to that. Some of those students were very so, ill. Well, some are ill. Some have extreme some family have extreme issues. Family issues. I mean, as long as they're as long as they're able to keep up academically, I personally I don't have any problem with a kid getting promoted who has you know a, extenuating circumstances, yeah. but still has learned. But still has done the work. Right. Well, that's the key. You know, that's that the is key. the key. Yeah. Because I'm sure there are plenty of students who show up every day who haven't done any of the work who are promoted. Well, just because their parents make them go, they don't do anything, but they still, unfortunately, a lot of times get promoted, which I think is terrible. Hey, so, Pat and Jackie, when it comes to officially what's listed as a missed day, uh, let's say you have a student who has a surgery and mm-hmm. has to rehabilitate and maybe they're home for two or three months but they get in in home instruction right mm-hmm. right yes maybe that in-home instruction is once a week whatever the schedule can allow for does that count as an absence or does that count as having attended and satisfied that, that the would needs? be an absence that would be an absence okay right. so someone who's out 60 days maybe that's a surgery or whatever but but if they've had in-home instruction and no. homework that they've got to do they would still make the grade homeschool is not counted as an absence but if you've got, yeah, I mean, if they're, not that would Canada not count as an absence. Absence. If they're no. finishing the work and they've just, they've demonstrated competency, they should be passed. And if you haven't, you shouldn't be. I mean, we need to get back to, I mean, I hate to say it. I mean, I hate to sound like an old fuddy-duddy, but we need to get back to how things were where, you know, if you, if you don't do the work, if you don't learn, you don't move to the next grade. There has to be some sort of a... I mean, it has to be like, oh my gosh, I got to get this work done, or my friends are going to be, you know, my friends are going to be going to high school next year, and I'm still going to be in, you know, eighth grade. Well, I, I've, I've, there's got to be accountability from the parents, or has to be accountability from the students, and uh, you know, without all that together with the staff, it won't, it's not going to work. So, in the past, you know, you'd have maybe a school that had two students that were attendance issues. Now you might have a school that has 115 students that are attendance issues. So then you have, you know, we only have so many attendance workers and they're beating the bushes to get these kids in. Uh, I mean, we, we ha- it starts at home. Oh, 100, I'm not blaming you guys at all. I'm not, I mean, not even a little bit. It's not, you have, like he said, you got no control. You can't go into the house and say, all right, get your trousers on, time to go to school. I did it one time. <laughs> well, not, I can, I can imagine that. I mean, is there, I mean, I know we have a transitional school for kids with behavioral issues who've had major behavioral problems. Is it possible to set up something and say, hey, well, you haven't shown up in the last month. When you come back, you're going to this other school where we're sending everybody who doesn't show up. Well, you'd, ha- well, you'd have to have several schools because uh, I think that would just be another out for students that would want to go there because they might think it's easier. Uh, uh, That's my opinion of that. I'm going to jump in here. Jump in quick. (laughs) We do have a code for these students that the five students, I don't know what it means. Uh, I used to. They told them to identify students having a CCF or JPF. So I think that's uh, uh, something court related or or something there it's not like a child has had cancer and that's and they're listed there yeah yeah so it's it's court related and i mean i've had i had a, a daughter who had autoimmune stuff going on she missed a lot of school but she got every single every single assignment done she graduated she did fine and she's actually at wvu and she's pre-med now but i mean she missed a ludicrous amount of school her junior and senior years we were trying to get her health figured out but there was never a day where we were like okay well you're not feeling well so you're you know you can stay home but you're not you're going to get the work done and you know we're going to figure everything out and she did thankfully but that's the difference she had a parent there who cared a parent who was like no it doesn't matter you know, you, you can be sick, you can be home, but you're still, you're going to learn. You're going to read, you're going to write, you're going you're gonna to learn. Well, we, we heard last night that the, the issue is now if a child gets a sniffle, they don't show up for school. If they have a headache, they don't show up for school. You know, when I was a kid, my mother's motto, my parents' motto was, you'll feel better when you get there. And well, but as, that was mine. As part of this COVID-related, though, Jackie, because obviously we had issues 
with the pandemic where kids and families were told if your child has a, a, a sniffle or cold-like symptoms, you've got to stay home because, what, let's face it, COVID symptoms were the common cold well, and meant for, for most people at the very beginning of it. Parents know the rules now. That's not, you know, that's not the, the issue. If you feel like they have something like that, test them and um, send them to school. But um, yeah. if we kept, if students, oh, if all the students stay out because they have a sniffle, we'll have the whole county out. True. Oh, so, yeah. But I'm, I'm wondering maybe if that's what parents got used to. I think they got used to that. Yeah. I mean, my my policy always was if you're not uh, if your temperature's not in the hundreds, and I mean you know a couple one or two, or you're not throwing up, you're going to school. You can feel like crap here. You can feel like crap at school, you know. But you're not going to sniffle your way to a, a day of playing video games and watching hey, TV. We got to do a break here. Pat, hold your thought. The challenge is: Did you forget your thought while Bodwell was distracting you during the break? No. I, oh, impressive. Yeah. Very that, impressive. I uh, I just we were talking about children in the going to school in the morning and their parents doing this and that. Some of the children don't have a parent available in the morning to uh, True. send them off. Uh, either the parent is still asleep because they worked a, a late shift, or uh, or they've gone to work early. Uh, they have to get up as you do early in the morning to to get to work, and uh, uh, they're not available. And, and some of these kids don't have a parent for a variety of reasons, including the opioid epidemic. Yes. Right. And they're, but the, uh, and some of the kids, uh, we've had children, I don't know, currently, but are homeless, mm -hmm. sleeping in tents. We have a large homeless population. Yeah. How large would you estimate it to be, Jackie? I, I can't remember what the number is, but it was uh, staggering to what I thought it would be. And. And homeless means they might be living with a grandparent and an aunt, or, or sleeping on a couch. Sleeping on a couch, and, and and you know when go back to students doing their homework and things like that. A lot of these kids come home to no one. So if you're a ch ch child, you're not, you're not going to get out. No, the I'm going to get. Them. I'm going to play on my phone or my iPad. I'm not going to do my work, and I'm, I probably won't get up and go to school in the morning because. There's no one there to make me go, so it's it's very very sad. It all it's heartbreaking. Pat, well, did you finish your thought? I'm well, sorry. one of the principals uh, told us that uh, uh, their students, I guess it was a high school student, takes their shower at the rest stop. Yeah. And they don't take a shower; they bathe in the sure. in the lavatory wow. at the rest stop. I have a question for you from uh, Faith Hill on our uh, Facebook page, or Faith Hall. I'm sorry. And Faith Hill, I believe, yes, is a not. singer. <laughs> She's not listening We're right now. We're just going to throw that out there. Faith Hill, just to shout out to Faith Hill. <laughs> when will construction begin on the new schools to alleviate overcrowding in the Hedgesville area? That well, will be a while. That, we're going through the, uh, the uh, process to be able to market our bonds. Uh, we're looking at May to uh, uh, be able to sell them, uh, give or take some weeks there. We just the other day had a special meeting to approve minutes from one of our meetings to include in a packet that we have to send to the Attorney General's office for a punch list in order to let us go on to the next step. And he has to prove that before we can do anything. Mm -hmm. It's a long it's a long process, yeah, a process. especially if you're getting state money. Mm -hmm. I mean you get the, the state building money. I mean yeah. It's, it's, not, a, they, it's a long process, period. Some so. people act like that's sort of a gift, but with all the money that comes out of Berkeley County that goes down to the state, you know, I think we should have three or four new schools by now, but that's just me, somebody who uh, feels like, you know, it's, it's great that we do help support, you know, other counties in this state, but at some point with the growth that we have, our schools should not be overcrowded when there are many, many counties with basically empty schools um, where we're sending so much money down to support those schools that we, we need to take care of our kids here a little more, I think. We're anxious to get started on the new schools and, me, and the improvements and, and the uh, uh, extensions to some of the schools. Tomahawk's getting an addition. Nice. Let me ask a, a question that, that really is on my mind. Through COVID, a lot of kids, obviously we had two years where you know, school was, was upside down. And a lot of kids did not get what they needed because of COVID. And it wasn't, I mean, just it's a fact of life. We say decisions were made. Looking back on those decisions, you know, we didn't have kids dying. We didn't have teachers dying. You know, and at the end of the day, you have to look at that. We lost one. 
Sorry, I didn't yes, realize that. Yes, we did lose one. The, um, but we got a lot of kids that are way behind right now, still. Um, I don't worry as much about the older grades because, I mean, my, my feeling about education, and I'm not an educator, I'm just somebody that's raised three kids <laughs> and was educated myself, thankfully. But those early grades are so important because as you get into the older grades, you're getting knowledge, you're learning things. But the early grades, the elementary school grades, that's where you are. You're getting your basics. You're getting the foundation that will enable you to learn once you get to middle school, high school, and beyond. Are we doing anything with uh, remediation as far as programs to get the younger kids caught up so that they are reading, they are proficient at reading, math, stuff like that? We have, uh, we've re received a sizable amount of COVID money, which we invested in personnel for remediation. Now, um, that money will run out uh, at the end of 20, next year. Yeah. And so we have a lot of people. We're going to have to figure out what how we're going to bring it back in because I just do not see Congress coming up with that kind of money again. Um, we've also had summer programs. Um, I don't know how how successful they've they've been to be accurate because when I look at the scores, I see I still see a dip, and we're re coming up, but not as fast as I think we should be to where we were before but uh, as I've said before we were moving students along before COVID that without accountability uh, more preoccupied with the graduation rate than the uh, the graduate uh, grasp of what they should know when they did that I hate uh, that. We, well, and that, and not to interrupt you, but that didn't come from the county. That came from the state. Oh yeah, no, no, of course. Yeah. That was that's a, it was a state directive. I just yeah. I hate that that's a directive. I mean, it's it's there. There's no greater responsibility mm -hmm. than to educate kids. And and I applaud the two of you for all of your efforts and the efforts of the whole board, and the the, the principals and the superintendent. I mean, everybody's on the same page. Everybody, everybody wants the same thing. They want the kids to get a good education so they can get out and be productive members of our society. Everybody's got a little bit different opinion as to how we should do that and what is best and what is not. Well, looking at it in retrospect, I said off, off mic or off air here, sometimes I wonder if we should have done like the college athletic programs did and just redshirted our students and kept them back a year and just going on. You know, there's a, in, in geology, there's a strata a layer of dirt that came when the comet hit and wiped out the dinosaurs. And I just wonder how we're going to be studying this era of the pandemic and the impact upon society, not only education, but health care, uh, mental health of our society, everything, everything else. We're, yeah. try we're going to try uh, as a priority in our budget to hang on to the mental health people. Uh, and and uh, because we just feel like that's that's one of the that's one of the problems that uh, our school administrators and teachers are telling us is just the impact of the, on the mental health of our students yep. during this period. We did hire uh, more interventionalist or or interventionalist period and additional academic coaches, and those people have been invaluable. The problem is. Are we going to be able to sustain those positions? With the tax base in this county, we should be able to. I mean, it's... Uh, we should be able to. We should be able to. I mean, whether the money comes or it doesn't, we're still growing like crazy, right? What I mean, how, what percentage are we growing, you know, year to year, roughly? About 200 to 300 students. So with every... I mean, a lot of the money we get back from the state is commensurate with how many students we have if i'm yeah. correct me if i'm wrong okay. so the more students we have the more money we have from the state is that directed to, are there state guidelines that say hey you have to have this student to teacher ratio yes but how how much in elementary how in what middle. in elementary and middle okay because yeah. i mean they're they're oh i'm sorry pat go on well one of the problems we're just counting students but berkeley county leads the state in the number of autistic students well, you have an alt you have a, a staff to student ratio of more than one to one there. 
uh, you have to have AIDS. You have uh, you have a high turnover because some autistic children are very violent, and uh, they bite, kick. Uh, you have people quitting because of. Of, of, of the physical well, abuse. And I'm and, glad and you brought that up. That's their, I, I want to ask you. So we right. have to work with that. But, it's but difficult. the adult also needs to be able to defend him or herself in those situations without uh, obviously taking it to a different level. And we've had highly publicized cases about that, not mm -hmm. just in Berkeley County, but across the country. And uh, that goes with. Uh, not just the classroom, but these students are transported to school where there's a school bus driver and hopefully there's a bus driver's aide mm -hmm. that can help as well. And my question to the two of you is, what freedoms do those adults who are in those situations who have been bitten, who have been spit on, who have been assaulted, what is their, what are their rights in terms of defending themselves? Right. And are, and do they face disciplinary action from the school system if they put hands on to right. get someone who's bitten their arm off their arm? Yeah, and yeah, they, what that's the and, problem. and what does a witness who see who sees the reaction and not the action that created the problem? Um, and the other problem you have is that you you we don't have enough trained people in those professional positions to deal with it. Uh, there's a high turnover rate, and. Um, and right. many of those positions are uncertified. We have uncertified people in those positions. Mm -hmm. And, and um, you know, when we, we were down 82 service positions when school started. And by the second or third day, we were down 22. But, you, you know, we just took any – this is terrible to say. We, did, we took anybody off the street to fill those – some of those aid positions because some, we needed somebody nobody. in the classroom yeah. and then you really get um people that don't have training to work with those students uh, so so what are, what are the uh how are you set up to defend the employees in situations where there's accusations of abuse somebody clamps onto my arm and they're biting me on the arm and this is i'm not talking about a four-year-old even though that would still hurt i'm talking about an adult uh, sized uh, child right. and and I'm trying to get that kid's mouth off my arm I might pull that kid by the hair to get their head off of my arm any way I can because they're biting through to, through my skin to the bone I'm going to get suspended probably for doing that because I handled the kid what yes, am I supposed to do sacrifice my arm right Isn't it? well that's I, the dilemma we're in well I, I received an email from one of our staff the other day and said look when they turn 18 and they do this stuff there's an accountability there. It's a, uh, out in society. Uh, a lot of times, uh, now come, we're come closer to your mic, Pat, please. Uh, we're trying to we're trying to uh, train our police officers how to handle people that have mental problems. But you 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 make a good point. We we uh, at the beginning of the year we got something from uh, I forget the police. Uh, At any rate, it, it's pillows. You have this square pillar with handles, and it was a it was a great big yeah. It, was, I, it reminded me of the pugil stick in the in the service. Sure, you know, yeah. Hitting with sticks and pads on the end there, and you had a helmet. And stuff. well, these employees all have helmets and 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 all the protective gear on their body, but they have this pillar, this square foam yeah. thing that they they try to push the child back into. Uh, uh, and, and our staff was being trained on that yeah. um, program to to be able to work with if you know if they're attacked by well nobody wants kids abused I no, think everyone sure. agrees on that but but you also need to be able to defend yourself against kids who don't realize what they're doing that's well, their disability and, and you know everybody's a mandated reporter so uh, employees are scared to death not to report Absolutely. something so then right away that person is taken out of the classroom off the bus mm -hmm. or wherever and Put on administrative leave until, hey. and that sometimes lasts months. And then DHHR does not have the in investigators come to and do the do all the work. So the and problem then, just keeps feeding itself. Yeah. Uh, so I, before we run out of time, I want to ask you some questions about uh, superintendent's position. Uh -huh. uh, we are now into January. The school year is half over. I know you folks recently took that up again as something to examine. Where are you with that? Okay, the the law. And the, the public, the, we are micromanaged a lot from Charleston. Uh, 
And the law tells you that, and it's in Chapter 18, Section 4, or Article 4, Section 1. And it tells you, you cannot begin until January. Mm-hmm. So last night at our first formal meeting of January, we, we started the process. Um, but th- that's, that's the first thing. The second thing is we have to announce by June the 1st who will be employed by July 1st. So w- our present superintendent, I'm sure, will be a, a candidate, a very viable candidate. But we decided to begin a search rather than just go ahead and move the interim into the position. We thought that we should, uh, by a majority, I think we should be uh, doing that. So we are next Thursday, we're going to meet by Zoom with Dr. Howard O'Call, who is is the retired executive director of the School Board Association, and he's going to give us parameters. I talked with him last night about mid uh, 11 o'clock when I got home. I live a little further from Hedgesill than Jackie. And we talked, and we're going to, we have two meetings planned now. Uh, Jackie doesn't know about the second one. In per, uh, we're going to do a Zoom meeting next Thursday, and then on the following Wednesday, he's going to come up, and we're going to get into it into further detail. Uh, another public service announcement about my wood stove here, but <laughs> uh, the uh, Bill Stubblefield's group is going to have a um, part of his institute have a uh, program on that Wednesday, that Wednesday I was talking about. I don't have my date here. I think it's the 19th? Yes. yes. I think yeah. We'll have Ashley Horst in studio to talk about that okay. uh, tomorrow, Good. I believe. Well, I, I saw it under uh, property uh, use of where they have it at Musselman High School on that day at 6 o'clock. So I hope to have the one meeting that we have with Miss Dr. O'Call finished by that time. I doubt if we will. But that's from 6 to 8, and that's going to be about growth and infrastructure here in the county, which looks like it's going to be a good, good, meeting. good meeting. Yeah, I and mean, you're always playing catch up with growth. And yes. with, with tax dollars, that could be one to two years where you're waiting for the tax dollars to catch up to the person who moved into the community. And then representation's 10 years. Yeah. So, uh, so Pat, in, in regards to the superintendent search, are you mandated that you have to open it up to a public search, uh, or could you legally could, just promote Ron Stevens? We could legally just promote Ron Stevens. So well, then why are you opening up to a search then? I, I, I personally, we didn't talk in great length about it. I, I don't believe we had a pretty long he- evening. But uh, I think for the community's benefit, we should assure them that we have looked everywhere before we settle on one person. That and position th- is very important. Does this necessarily imply one way or the other your satisfaction or dissatisfaction with the job the current interim superintendent is doing? No, no ma- not matters, at all. Matter of fact, we have to evaluate Mr. Stevens by March the 1st. I think he did an exemplary job during the uh, school bond uh, process. Uh, and I've seen other uh, good examples of leadership. But but I believe that for the community's benefit, we should look at uh, look at an entire field, and then uh, make our decision. Johnny, do you have um, have you have you sort of put it out? I mean, I know it probably hasn't been put out officially, mm-hmm. but do you have an idea of some people? You know, through your knowledge of of you know just education people you know are there are there some people you may want to reach out to in smaller systems and say hey we'd like to talk to you about this job. Oh, it'll be it'll be ever well. We'll have to decide how it's how it's put out. But I would think we would we'll have to figure out whether we just want to do an area search, whether we want to do a national search, or you know just West Virginia or what. We'll just, decide that as a board. Okay, I just didn't know if there were people that you had in mind no, and no, thought. Okay, no, not at all. No, no, I, I what I want to have stress this is my own personal feeling is somebody with a strong academic uh, background of getting their subordinates to uh, push the uh, the ceiling of, of your expectations for the students well, I think that that definitely describes yeah. Ronnie Stevens um, but I think it's I, I agree with you guys I think it's I think it's good that you are not just rubber stamping it um, I think it's good that you're going to take a look around and for the best of the community and if he comes out as, as the best candidate, that's wonderful. I mean, I, I like Ron Stevens. I think he does a phenomenal job and always has. I think we have to keep personalities out of it, definitely. So, But, but that individual also has to be able to work well with the public and, and staff. So, 
The legislative session gets underway tomorrow. The West Virginia legislature is going to be looking at public education, either through the Senate or all three branches, but we know Senate President Craig Blair has said want to fo- uh, focus on public education in this particular legislative session. Do you have any idea? Have you had a meeting with Senator Blair yet to find out what his focus will be, or is there anything you're watching for? Well, we... He was on... We had a meeting with our local legislators, and he was on the mm-hmm. line, but I don't believe he said anything. No. Uh, Amy, Amy Grady um, was on also. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I appreciated her. She was on by virtual or Zoom, one of the other the other and uh, listen to our concerns which are so different she's from marion county it's a lot different in berkeley county than Mm -hmm. in marion county and she even indicated that some of the things she heard she was sort of surprised at that you know our our concerns so i'll be interested to see what comes up in the legislative session that's good for the especially good for this area and our state who is your lobbying arm in charleston for Berkeley County or the Eastern Panhandle when it comes to education? Well, we have the uh, School Board Association uh, lobbies on our behalf as far as school boards. But uh, uh, we work with our, our associations. You have a principal's association. You have a superintendent's association. You have the uh, rank-and-file teachers and service pe- personnel. Jackie was president of the uh, state service personnel association i was president of the state school board association so uh, we we have that insight but we do not as a county spend any money on a lobbyist lobbyist. and i'm not telling you that you should but are there opportunities that you could better take advantage of to make sure people like the person who's in charge of education uh, the Education Committee and the Senate are, are aware, or the House is aware, of what your needs are in Berkeley County. Well, well I think, I, I mean, Pat's known to those individuals, and I definitely am, because I did lobby. Um, so I, I think we have good insight as far as uh, being able to get, if I wanted to go to Charleston and get in those offices, I feel like I could at least get in and talk with our but, individuals. But I have to, as an uh, as a school board member, we're nonpartisan. Yeah. So we can't get into endorsing candidates for office. Uh, I know that's where the point of leverage is, but uh, I, I, the nature of our uh, nonpartisan uh, electability, I think we have to maintain that and work with the will of what the people have sent there. Well, I'm not telling you to be political, but I'm saying oh, maybe okay. more informational, right? If, if Amy Summers is not. You mean Amy Grady? I'm sorry, Amy Grady is not aware of what the needs in Berkeley County are, then or we need to make sure that Amy Grady is. Yeah, and I'm hoping our uh, delegation of senators and uh, uh, delegates can definitely make them aware of what are. Do you think maybe, oh, do you think, oh, no, 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 I'm listening, Jackie. I'm, <laughs> do you think maybe having our own advocate down there because our needs are so much different than probably 54 other counties, 52 other counties at least, just based on our growth, expansion, and our needs, and the fact that we have such a large tax base here that it might be worthwhile asking the Berkeley County Commission, maybe we should have at least a part-time lobbyist down there trying to push for our school system, because the statewide organizations, they're pushing for statewide issues. And most of the issues are, hey, our schools are our schools are shrinking. We've got a nine to one teacher ratio. We've got two second grade teachers and only eighteen second graders in the county. Right. We have different would it benefit Berkeley County to just try a pilot program where we pay somebody to go down and lobby just for us? I I disagree. I, I think, think that's so. why we elect our legislators to go down and do it. I was a legislator at one time and, and we, we had success, but I, I just feel like we're going we're gonna to sit down with, uh, and Jack and I haven't discussed this, but I'm going to sit down with the county, <laughs> county commission. Breaking news. Yeah, yeah. You heard it here first. I heard it first. Damon's probably listening to it, too. Yeah, and, and uh, Melissa and, and, uh, and Michael. But we have to, we're going to sit down with our local um, um County Commission. County Commission, but I, I, I think it's weak 
it, it's a weak reflection on your legislative delegation if you have to hire someone to go down. Uh, I know the owner of this station is on the House Education Committee. He showed a lot of interest at the meeting uh, to come to, uh, when he was at the board. We, he asked for information. We were giving it to him. He seems like he's going to do the job that I, I think a lobbyist might be doing, but I think he's. I think we put our faith in our legislators and the ones who sit on those committees we have to communicate with and develop a relationship with. Well, well uh, th there you go. Sorry, I Jack. was just going to say, uh, uh, as much as input I felt that I had when, when I was in Charleston with service personnel, the bottom line is the rest of the state doesn't want to hear the Eastern Panhandle's concerns. And I heard that many times. Stop whining about this area. They're perfectly happy to take our tax dollars. So, and, that's, and nothing's changed. Right. Nothing's changed. Hey, we need to stop. This hour went uh, by faster than you probably thought it would when yeah. you had to wake up early and get here today. <laughs> so I appreciate you doing that. Late. <laughs> right? Uh, your next board meeting is in two weeks. Our next yeah. board meeting is on going to be on this Thursday, uh, coming uh, this Thursday of this it's week. Oh, okay, it's two days. It's a work session. It's a work session. We're going to begin the superintendent's discussion. Very good. Thank you both. Appreciate Thank you coming you. in today.